Uh, we have been going through the book of 1 Thessalonians. Actually, a whole, we're going to do a study through both of the two letters that Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church. And so we are taking a look at what that letter has to say. Let me give you a little bit of a background while we do some technology. Marty, you need to get through? You need to get through or anything? Okay. Um, let me uh, give you a little bit of quick background on a couple things. Okay. And that is, this is one of the earliest letters that Paul wrote. And in terms of, he set up a church, he was on a traveling, he was a missionary, uh, you know, disciple, he was moving along, building the church, he goes, ends up in Thessalonica, where there's no believers there, but there is a synagogue, and he begins teaching in the synagogue for three straight Sabbaths, and teaches the, um, sorry, it's a little distracted, uh, can you bring the house lights up? Just, I don't know, things just throw me off here for a second. Um, all right, so he's teaching in, or he's, he's established a church in Thessalonica, and he, he's driven out of the church because, or out of the city of Thessalonica because there's people there who hate the gospel. They have hated the gospel. They are moving Paul out, so he's, he's ministering there with Timothy and Silas. They end up in Athens, and his heart, though, is, I wanted to teach this church more about the truth, more about the doctrines of Christ, more about how to live and endure in this season that we are living in. And so Paul has both moved on, and yet his heart is still with the church in Thessalonica. Okay? Hope that makes sense, right? There's a lot of persecution going on. A lot, he's actually beaten and stoned and all these kind of things, every, every place he preaches, and he gets driven out. But his heart is to look back his heart is to rebuild and to establish this church. And so he writes this letter to them in response to a few questions they probably had. And he writes because he has a heart. He prays for this church daily. He has great concern for their health in terms of spiritual health. He knows they're facing persecution. He knows that the times are tough for them. And so he's over in Athens and he's thinking about this church. And so he writes a letter to them and indicates a couple of things. One, I've been praying for you. Two, I'm so glad to hear that all reports say that you're thriving. People hundreds of miles away are being influenced and converted to Christ because of your witness, he tells the Thessalonian church. Okay? So he's greatly concerned about their health, but he's also greatly pleased that things are going well for them. And he's looking at his own life, and he's recognizing that there is a sense of both a hindrance coming or already upon this church, but he has, he's going to express great hope in what this church will be accomplishing in terms of both the life in, that we have today, continuing to minister the gospel of Christ, but he's the greatest hope that we see all through the book of Thessalonians is a hope in the future, meaning eternity, okay? So I'm gonna, the title today is Hindrance and Hope. We're looking at both the fact that we should expect in the church hindrances to come. Without fail, hindrances should come. But none of that will, should ever change the hope that we have that Christ is in charge. So that's a quick review of the first chapter and into the second chapter. You might recall a couple of weeks ago he was talking about how he was so pleased that they were imitating him because he was imitating Christ and that is leading to good results for them. Okay. You're going to see they're also going to have the same kind of experience that the church way down in Judea or in Jerusalem were having because of their being persecuted for the faith. Okay. So with that as a setup, let's just take a look here. We are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 14, picking up where we left off last week. So Paul is the author. He's writing to the church in Thessalonica. He writes this. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time, in presence, but not in heart, 
endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or our joy or our crown or of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. A lot going on there, right? There's a whole lot going on there. Paul acknowledging he has been driven away from them, but has a heart to stay with them or to return to them. He wants to come back. He knows that they're enduring great suffering. He also knows that the church in Judea is suffering by their own countrymen who hate the message of the gospel of truth. And so there's a lot of suffering going on, and yet Paul has great hope in all of these things. So we're going to talk a little bit, because it's unavoidable today, about Satan. Some people go, oh, don't talk about Satan in church. Well, Let's make sure that we recognize that we do actually have an adversary who is causing or has an, an organization, if you will, of spiritual forces of darkness that are causing hindrances to the global church, to the local church, and to us as individuals as we attempt to live a life that is pleasing to God and faithful to him. Okay. Christians in the church didn't just invent some adversary. It's actually a biblical principle. He's actually a biblical person, personage in the spiritual realm. And we should do well to understand at least a little bit about him. Now, we could spend weeks and weeks just talking about Satan and his career and all the things that he's done. We're going to hold off on that and just look at him in terms of how he brings a hindrance to the progress of the church and a hindrance to the progress of our Christian faith as we endure what he brings as an attack. So just as to set this up as a foundation, Satan, the term, the name, a title, okay, or name, Satan literally means adversary in the Old Testament. It's used 18 times in the Old Testament, and it's used as a proper name of the specific angel who has fallen from grace because of his pride. So he's an actual name. That's what Satan is used as a description of who he is. He's Satan, but what is Satan? He's an adversary. What is he an adversary above? Everything that God endorses, and he hates what God loves, and he loves what God hates, right? All the things. He's the adversary of everything, first of God and then of everything else, all the will and desires of God that he has to see fulfilled. In the New Testament, it's even multiplied, okay? First off, they just use the term satanus, which means it's a transliteration. It not a, they're not taking a definition of what does adversary mean in Greek. They just said, well, it worked well in Hebrew. He's the adversary. He's Satan. So we're just going to Greek guys the name, make it you know, a Greek title or Greek name, and it is the, the, the term in the New Testament, satanus. And it's used 36 times. So 18 in the old, it magnifies or amplifies in the new up to 36 times. So again, a real personage with real power and in some cases some real authority operating under the true headship of God. But he's an adversary of all things God and all things of people who follow God. We also know him by the term the devil okay, or in Greek diabolos. So he's the Diabolos, meaning the false accuser or the slanderer of truth 33 more times. So that's a lot of references in the New Testament. 27 books, we got 33 references to the devil and 38 or 36 it was of the term Satan. That's a quite a number of references to this personage who we need to know about so that we can understand his schemes, prepare for them, and be ready to walk against them. And actually walking in his, in God's provision for us as we see our need to be holy and pure in God. And here's a, a whole list of different titles that you might see in scripture of him. Again, we could look at Genesis 3, we could look at Job chapters 1 and 2, we could look at Matthew 4 and the parallel counts, we could look at Revelation 12, those are the big chapters where Satan is sort of addressed, okay? 
But here we have, he's the accuser of the brethren. He's accusing you of things you did or things you haven't done to try and tear you down. God is forgiven. God can forgive our sins, but he's going to keep accusing us as long as we allow him to bring up our past sins. And in some cases, he'll accuse us of things we haven't done. Or he'll accuse us of things that we are doing that are actually approved by God, but, but the world hates. And so the world hates it, but God approves of it, so he's going to accuse us before others. He's the evil one. He's the wicked one. He's the dragon of old. He's the tempter. He's the serpent of old. He's the ruler of the world. That's what Christ calls him. He's the actual current ruler of this world. Not overpowering God, but certainly has authority that he is commandeered from the events of Genesis chapter 3. He's the roaring lion, goes about seeking who he can kill, steal, and destroy from, right? He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the god of this age. He's our enemy. He's a deceiver. Anything up there really all that you know, like drawing us to him. And yet, Scripture says that he draws people to himself because of his lies and his deception. So we recognize that this all seems negative and terrible, and yet somehow people, the world around, keep getting drawn into his kingdom, into his schemes, and avoiding or rejecting the good and perfect God we just spent 30 minutes singing praise and worship to. This guy is, we think he's awful and, and ugly, and yet somehow people are buying into his deceptions. Far more than you probably would ever account it or credit it to. But Satan in Scripture, his ways are clearly exposed. We need to understand the kind of things that he does. First thing that we can look at, he vigorously opposes the will of God. Whatever God's will is, Satan, you can be sure, is on the opposite side of it, and he's trying to vigorously oppose what God wants. Now, what does God want? I mean, in the purest, simple sense, God desires all men to be saved. God desires all men to be saved. What is Satan attempting to do? He's trying to make sure that as few people can be saved as possible through all of his wicked, deceitful schemes. Okay. So he seeks, to dis he seeks to oppose God's will. He seeks to distract us, to confuse us, and to destroy as many human souls as he possibly can. He wants to distract us with our technology. He wants to distract us with our jobs. He wants to distract us with our relationships. He wants to distract us with our own physical needs. Rather than seeking God first, and then letting all these things be added to us. Right, as Christ has said. He wants to vigorously oppose God's will. He's going to distract. He's going to confuse. We see no greater example of this. We've been talking about it even over the last couple of weeks. He wants to confuse. He wants to tell us, oh, that Bible, wasn't that just written by a bunch of men? Hasn't it been proven wrong? All these kind of things. He wants to confuse. He wants us to have doubts about the authority, the veracity, the truthfulness of God's word. But holding firm to this is what God wants us to do. Christ said, your word is truth. Right? Paul said, every word that proceeds from God is the word of God. Peter said the same thing about how no prophecy came by private interpretation, but holy men spoke as they were moved along by the Spirit. God's word testifies it's true. Satan wants to confuse as many people as possible into thinking you can't trust his word. So we have to understand his ways, and we can expose them. That's what we're trying to do this morning is make sure we recognize when we start seeing sods of doubt, seeds of doubt, I don't know what I just said, but seeds of doubt sown into our minds about the veracity and the truthfulness of God's word, we need to recognize there's a satanic component to that. Every time there is a doubt about the trustworthiness of God's word. Now, we can read it. We can say, I don't understand that. I'm having troubles with the interpretation. I'm even having troubles with how can we call God good and moral and right when he opens up the earth and swallows up people inside of it. And yet, we recognize the truth. Scripture clearly, plainly de de declares God's word is true. And God is good, and God is love, and God desires all men to be saved. He's all of these things. But we read, we need to have an attitude 
that says God's word will stand true and my role, my responsibility is to submit to what it says. That's my role, to submit to what it says, to do my best as an interpreter, to properly understand it, to properly live by it, to encourage others to do the same. Satan wants to jumble all of that up and turn us into people of doubt, people of confusion, people of continued strife and contention about the meaning of this and the meaning of that. And so the church divides and the church separates and the church gets all kinds of negative publicity because we, we struggle with the understanding God has to have absolute authority. And he's communicated that true authority in his word. Satan is the one who's causing all of those challenges within the church to stay true and firm to a sound biblical doctrine that Paul preaches on wherever he goes. Satan also always tries to offer a counterfeit, I have to put it in quotes, truth, right? He wants to tell you something that's not true is true, a counterfeit claim of truth. He's always trying to counterfeit that so that he can blind the people who are lost or keep them blind from seeing the glorious light of God, from seeing the truth of what Scripture reveals, from seeing that God has an intention to bring us into eternal life with him and to lead the faithful away from God. We could have either one of those people in those, this category here in the room today. You could have, you'd be somebody saying, I, have, I don't believe in God. Well, guess what Satan wants to do? He wants to keep your eyes blinded and your heart closed to the truth. If you're a believer, which I assume most of us are in this room, Satan wants to get you off the rails, off the race course. He wants to distract you. He wants to deceive you. He wants to confuse you. He wants to get you where God wants you going here. He wants to get you going any place but where God wants you to go. Okay? He's trying to lead the faithful away from God, God's will, God's plan, God's purposes, and he wants to keep the lost, as many who are not professors of Christ in faith, he wants to keep as many of them in that category as he can. He hates when we preach the truth he hates when people come to Christ because he's losing that battle because he knows that's what God's will is and he wants something that always opposes God's will. Okay. And we even talked about this a little bit last week, so I'll just throw this one graphic back up. This is what Satan is attempting to do. He constantly is trying to attack the foundation of believers' faith so that the whole castle of our foundational system that we live and understand to be true begins to collapse and fall apart. And we're seeing that in the church today. Over the 2,000 years of church history, we are in a time and a season where church is not expanding and growing and filling the whole world. It's constricting, it's contracting, it's coming back down to a small, very small number of people. I keep telling you guys the same statistics over and over again, but I'll tell you a few more. You know, 66% of pastors in America do not hold to a biblical worldview. And imagine the fewer number of people, actual congregants, who actually hold a biblical worldview. We know that number is into the single digits, something like 6 to 8% of Christians in America who put a checkbox in a survey that says, yes, I'm a Christian. We know that about 6% of them to maybe 8% have a biblical worldview. That's not my interpretation of the data. That's hard statistical fact that has been confirmed by multiple surveys over the last, let's say, decade. Okay. Satan appears, as I said, though, like an angel of light, rather than as the horrifying demonic presence that he actually is. I don't know how he does it, but if we had eyes like God has to see Satan and the things that he does, we would see a horrific being Okay. One that's corrupt to the core, one who has nothing but malevolent intentions for everything he sees, everything he touches. But somehow he has presented himself as an angel of light. And people keep getting drawn into the deception, drawn into the lies, drawn into all that he is doing. That's how someone like Paul can be so persecuted. Okay. It's not like it's neutral. Paul walks in, there's, as we talked about before, but in the Roman Empire and this whole world, you know, you got 30,000 gods. 
And Paul could have walked into Thessalonica and spoken of one of any one of 29,999 gods and been, oh, thank you, Paul, that's really nice, appreciate that. He talks about Jesus Christ, they get out the whips, they start scourging him, they get out the stones, they start stoning him, they beat him, they toss him out of the city. For one name, one person, that's it. The other 29,999 gods that we're fine with. This one is the one that Satan continues to bring brutal attacks against the church in. So he's an angel of light, but he's drawing people in. Even what seems to be good-hearted, well-intentioned people saying, well, we can't tolerate that kind of doctrine around here. Let's get the stones out. Right? He's intentionally ginning up people who think somehow they're doing something good, maybe even convinced they're doing something for God, but they failed to check their understanding with the truth and authority of God's word. They went along with the mob. They went along with the crowd. They went along with the cultural pressures of the day and said, oh, that's what the church is now. Oh, that's how we handle these topics now. And someone like Paul gets stoned and beaten. Don't know when that'll happen in America, but I don't expect it'll take too long. But Satan will continue to stir up strife and contention and hatred against the truth and anyone who dares to proclaim it. Don't you feel all up, uplifted and happy this morning that, hey, if I stand for truth, Satan is coming for me. Well, he is. We should know that that's the actual MO of the adversary. Okay. Paul then goes on to describe, Jesus was killed by the demands of the angry mob there in Jerusalem. He says they, this angry mob in Jerusalem that hates the truth of God, they brought Jesus to be delivered to the cross. They crucified him. They killed him. Guess what? Even though that's in Jerusalem, in the region of Judea, the same thing, because the same power that's working behind what brought Christ to the cross is working here in Thessalonica. They're trying to destroy the message of the truth of the gospel here. Why? Because it's the same power. It's the same source. It's the same adversary accomplishing the same tasks. So the believers in Judea, actual believers in Christ in Judea, were suffering persecution. If you don't know, after 30 AD, after the cross, Jesus and the disciples and the cross and all that, churches started to grow and expand in the region of Judea first, just as Jesus said, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, right? It's growing, but the church in Jerusalem, the church in Judea, was incredibly severely persecuted under intense persecution. Okay. And Paul says that same intense persecution he knows is happening or is occurring or will come to this church in Thessalonica. Because it's just as the Jews or the believing uh, Jews in Jerusalem had suffered persecution, okay, they're also, the, the um, Thessalonicans, are still going to suffer the same kind of attack. Then he also says, look, this isn't, been, this isn't something new. This isn't something that's just happened in the last, let's say, 20 years since the gospel went out and Paul starts writing to the church here in about 50 AD. He says, this hatred against God's truth, this opposition to God's will, has been happening all the way back in the Old Testament. Right? Jesus even makes reference to the same. You know, which one of the Old Testament prophets have you not killed, Jesus says to the Pharisees. The prophets of the Old Testament were killed once again by who? People under Satan's schemes killing the truth or attempting to kill God's message. So the prophets. So this is not something new. It's been happening since the Garden of Eden back in Genesis chapter 3. Satan then acted to silence Paul from sharing the gospel with the Gentiles so that they would be saved. Like, Paul's on these missionary journeys. We know specifically and recorded in Scripture of three long extended missionary journeys where he goes out into the world. He's called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He goes out on circuits. He get, begins to proclaim the gospel of truth, begins to establish churches, and all along the way, Satan has been trying to silence Paul because he doesn't want the Gentile world to be saved. Paul in Romans writes, you know, how will they believe unless someone speaks the truth to them, unless a preacher is sent to them? 
Paul is being sent out. Satan is, now Satan is not omnipresent. You know what that means? Satan isn't everywhere, but he has an entire organization of princes of power of darkness and evil schemes. He's got all kinds of organizational systems, and he is continuing to operate as the ruler of this world who's attacking anyone and anything that stands for the truth of God's word. Satan, unfortunately, I just have to be blunt, Satan uses weak and gullible people as pawns in his war against God. He can't do much for a person who believes and is rooted and grounded in the truth. Can't really do much because that person is strong in faith, strong in their commitment to God and their commitment to following him regardless. Now, think about Paul. Paul's not a pawn. Paul's going out there, he gets beaten, he gets stoned, he gets whipped, he gets shipwrecked, he gets all these things, he just keeps on going. He keeps going, picking up wherever God allows him to pick up, he picks up and goes and keeps sharing the gospel some more. But Satan's not looking for that, I mean, he's certainly looking to kill or destroy Paul, but he's really interested in pawns, weak and gullible people who will go, oh, okay, I'll let, that's what I'll do today. Now, I don't know if, how many are chess players. I can't say that I actually am. But how many look at a chessboard and go, I sure desire to be a pawn in this chess match. Right? We recognize. Now, God says he's going to make us kings and priests. He's going he's to give us the highest authority back here. Satan wants to turn as many people into pawns as he possibly can because he knows they're expendable. He knows that if he can corrupt their thinking corrupt their commitment to God, that he can not only use them to destroy their own life, but he can use them as his pawn to destroy other people's lives. I don't want to be a pawn. How do we, I think most of us say, I don't want to be a pawn. How do you avoid being a pawn in Satan's schemes? We get grounded in the truth. We have an unwavering commitment to God through Christ And we refuse in any capacity to compromise on what God's truth of his word has claimed to us. That's how we remain out of that row of pawns. But Satan's pawns, I need you to know, Satan's pawns, those people that Satan is using because they're weak or gullible or their guard is down, the pawns will be held responsible for their sins, their own actions. So we can't get to say, none of us gets to stand before the great white throne judgment and say to God, well, I was just a pawn. Satan deceived me. Satan tricked me. I wouldn't have done that if blah, 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 blah. You think that's going to work as an excuse before God? No. We're called to be people of the word. We're called to be hold firm to the truth of scripture. We are called to be wise, right? Wise. Jesus even says, be wise as serpent, but gentle as doves. We're called to be wise in our understanding. With the moment you feel some pressure on you to act like a pawn, you better put the brakes on and say, wait a minute. I need to go back to the foundation. I need to go back to the truth and authority of God's word. I need to know where God is leading me because I don't want to be a pawn in Satan's scheme. God's wrath will be poured out on all those who follow Satan, even by the means of deception. And we know, I can confirm from Jesus' own words, that unfortunately, while this is not God's will, the majority of the human population over the last 6,000 years will go through the wide gate and they'll stay on the broad path that Jesus says leads to destruction. He says himself that difficult is the way and narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life and few will find it. We should be just convicted and convinced that we want to be on that difficult path, go through that narrow gate, and recognize that as as sad as it is, by their own choice, the world is a bunch of pawns on a very easy, wide path going through a great big wide gate that leads to destruction. Now, God calls us to try and communicate to the pawns and to those who are being deceived, hey, God has something better for you. 
God has a will for your life. God has promised eternity, to, eternal life, if you will surrender, if you will submit, if you will believe in his son. But most of the world, for most of history, keeps saying, I don't want to hear that. I'm okay where I'm at. And you know uh, with 100% certainty that's a deception, as we would call it, straight out of the pits of hell, straight from the deceiver himself, the accuser of the brethren. We know it comes from Satan. But how can we convince? How can we evangelize or share the truth of the gospel? Well, however God and the Holy Spirit leads us, we should be willing, obedient, faithful servants to speak the truth in love, to be able to communicate you know, and it probably doesn't do well, and if you're not a believer today, you might be offended already, but it probably doesn't do well to walk up to somebody and say, you're just a pawn in Satan's scheme. <laughs> probably not going to be the effect you're looking for. But you and I both know if we're grounded in the truth of Scripture, that's really what's happening, right? All those lies, all those deceptions, all of that scheming is intended to keep them away from God on a very broad path that absolutely leads them to destruction. We've got to ask the Spirit for wisdom on how we can best witness in every opportunity and every occasion he might lay before us. It's so important that we do that. Now, <clears throat> something we should recognize, I think this is true, while you won't find the term skirmish, I don't think, in Scripture, okay? Satan wins, I believe, many skirmishes in this ongoing battle, but he cannot be victorious over those who serve God. Okay. He will win many skirmishes, and that might cause doubt or that might cause disappointment in any one of us. Because, you know, some people think, I'm going to go to church today and I'm going to confess my faith in Jesus Christ, and all of my problems will go away. All my relationship problems, all my financial problems, all my health problems, all my everything is just going to go away because I came to God, right? No. Why? Because Satan is going to continue to bring as many skirmishes as he can to try and pull every believer off track. But he, we know from Scripture he cannot be victorious in the final battle. Okay. So Paul and his companions were driven out of Thessalonica, as I've described, that's a skirmish. They were driven out. Paul wanted to stay there and keep preaching the gospel. Satan ginned up a whole bunch of angst and hatred towards Paul and his companions, and they were successful in taking Paul and his companions out of Thessalonica. Skirmish. Victory? No. Skirmish? Accomplished? Yes. If you recall from uh, Acts chapter 17, Jason was dragged out of his house. He was apparently a host house for Paul and his companions. <clears throat> Sorry, they left, so they dragged Jason out and they beat him. Hey, that's a skirmish. Jason was beaten, dragged out of his house and beaten. Most of us probably have never experienced that and never want to experience that. Jason did, but that's a skirmish. Satan didn't win the battle. He just won a small skirmish in this ongoing attack. And then despite the threat of violence, as we saw here in the text, Paul recognizes there's violence waiting him in Thessalonica. Where's Paul's heart? I want to go back to Thessalonica. There's no victory there. He didn't convince Paul to stop sharing the gospel with the Gentiles. He didn't convince Paul to not have a heart of prayer and compassion for the people in the church at Thessalonica. No, he, kept, he desired to go back. So Satan did not win that victory over Paul's heart for his love, his care, his compassion for the church here in Thessalonica. Paul was, however, unable to return because Satan, he said, in this text that we read, Satan is actively hindering us. We want to go back. Satan is hindering us. That's a skirmish. Satan is accomplishing some kind of limited victory, tactical victory, we might call it. It's a skirmish. But Paul's heart hasn't changed. God's message to the church hasn't changed. In fact, the church is doing all they can to share the gospel hundreds of miles away, as we looked at in chapter 1. Nevertheless, the gospel is spreading. The church here, Paul identifies as healthy, and they are filled. Both Paul and the church is filled with hope, despite this incredible persecution, incredible attacks against them physically, 
and in probably in as many other ways as they can, like financially or economically being able to actually transact as in commerce in the city. They're doing all they can. Satan and his schemes are doing all that is possible to knock this church off of God's race course. But there's no victory here. They had hope. They were sharing the gospel. They were living in Paul. The, the report that Paul heard from them or about them was this church is doing well. Satan can never gain victory, but there are places where he has skirmishes that look like an apparent victory at times. Okay. But the thing that's true beyond measure here in this text is that Paul had absolute and ultimate confidence that he would celebrate with these believers in heaven. I want you to just picture this attitude of Paul's heart for the moment. Paul doesn't know the future. He only knows what God's revealed to him. He knows that he's been called to suffer violence while sharing the gospel to the Gentile world. He knows that he keeps getting opposed. He keeps getting beaten. He keeps getting shipwrecked. He keeps going on these missions and he's converting or he's helping be being used by God to convert people to the gospel of Christ. But he also sees that there's all kinds of troubles and all kinds of, uh, you know, persecution that's happening against him. He has no idea, I believe, when he wrote this letter, he has no idea of the people that he loves and prays for and desires, longs to go back and see if he'll ever see them again on earth. But what is his confidence? He has absolute hope. Look, you know, in the small little skirmishes that we're enduring, I may never see you again, although I want to. We are going to have such a celebration in heaven when we all get there, this is going to be fantastic. So it really doesn't matter if I see you in Thessalonica ever again. I'm going to see you in heaven. That's Paul's joy. He's like, this stuff doesn't really faze me. I know what I want to do. I know I love this church. I know I pray for this church. I want great things for this church. But if I never see them again in the earthly body, I will see them in a heavenly glory. And that is where Paul's greatest victory and confidence in. So Satan has no victory in this at all. Satan can never win against true believers in this area. Okay? He can kill the body. He can do all kinds of torment to us. He can cause all kinds of challenges in our life, but he can never rob us of the future glory if we have faith in Christ. And he can never rob us of that incredible, joyous celebration in the heavenly places when we actually see one another again. I think this is a, a specific statement to say, we will see and recognize people that we've known on earth. We will see them in heaven. There's going to be millions, billions of people in heaven. And we're all going to have a story to tell. And we're all going to have something to share. And we're all going to have, you know, but we are going to see people that we have had a relationship with here on this earth. And we're going to celebrate with them in heaven. Of course, that ought to maybe remind us to be kind and gentle and loving to people here on earth because, you know, it's a little, little challenging when you go, oh yeah, I kind of, I left the church because that person really offended me and I never told them about it or whatever the thing that happened was, right? We recognize, I'm going to see that person in heaven. I want to be celebrating and joyous with them, not chagrined. I don't know what it looks like in heaven, don't, don't get me wrong. But I don't want to be looking at someone and go, oh, I wronged that person, but I know they've forgiven me in Christ now. Don't we want to be up there going, oh, you, I haven't seen you in 30 years, but we've been praying for you. Where We've been absolutely confident that because of your faith and my faith, we will be rejoined again in heaven. All right, so this is our true eternal hope in Christ. It lays out our true eternal hope. This is what gives us the ability to look at every situation, every pain and suffering, every persecution, every hardship that could possibly be faced on earth and say, yeah, that is, this pales in comparison. It's insignificant compared to the glory that will be revealed for me in heaven. We look at every situation with absolute confidence, no matter what Satan throws at us here. Because you know what? There's one place I guarantee you Satan won't be. He won't be within heaven. He won't be an adversary. He won't be bringing about all the same kind of stuff that's happening here. Just God, just God's angels, just God, the four living creatures and the 24 elders and everything that's up there in heaven, right? Not Satan. 
Satan, if he spends any second in time at all, it'll be to be judged and cast into the lake of fire. Right? That's it. That's Satan's destiny. And he knows it. We know it too, because we know the truth of Scripture. So even in the face of Satan's hindrances that he brings to us, Paul, as we see here, had an indescribable level of joy in Christ. Doesn't matter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do God's will. God knows what I'm going through. God knows what Satan is throwing at me. Whatever God wants, he will accomplish as long as I surrender to him. After that, what do I care? If I go back to Thessalonica, don't go back. It doesn't matter to me. I know what I want, but it doesn't really matter because I'm only going to do what God calls me to do. I'll go where he says to go. I will say what he says to say. I will be obedient. This is why Paul loves to call himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Somebody who is totally surrendered and obedient to the authority of Christ. The good news, of course, is that all believers will be united in eternal life to come. We just talked about that. And we will all share in a mutual joy of salvation with one another. Believers will have eternity. We don't know what that means. I mean, I, I, you know, we can look at a line of infinity and go, I don't know what that means. But we will have eternity, whatever that means, to share in our mutual joy of how God has accomplished salvation for us. There's something glorious and beautiful and worth celebrating yet to come. And if for every moment we get to live on this earth in some level of peace and tranquility and lack of being opposed directly or powerfully by Satan, well, that's great on this earth. But it can't possibly compare to the joy inexpressible that will happen in heaven. So it's a certainty. If we're a believer in Jesus Christ, this hope that I'm describing is an absolutely certain future event. And it should fill every believer with joy help to get our minds off of the present and into the future. Really, we really need to start thinking that way, right? I mean, we, don't, we don't ignore our responsibilities in the present. We don't pretend like we're not hurting. We don't pretend like something is not wrong when it is. But the joy inexpressible in us should say, I, it, it can't possibly compare. It can't possibly drag me down or get me to stop trusting in the goodness of God because I know what kind of true blessing he has for me in the future. So it's certainty as a future event should fill us with joy, but the uncertainty as to the timing of when we'll see Christ should ch challenge us to remain as faithful to Christ as we possibly can so that we are always ready for his appearance. In our individual lives, that can happen through a car accident or a heart attack or this disease or whatever it may be. Or in a blink or twinkling of an eye, Jesus Christ could come. Either way, because we don't know when it's coming, we ought to want to live in a way that Satan doesn't have authority over our lives. God always does. I want to live in full, complete surrender to him. I hope I can convey that's what God wants for you. To live in full, complete, total surrender to him with this joy inexpressible, knowing that if before you can even breathe your next breath, something eternal changes in you, you're ready to go. And that's why God never tells us really with certainty when he's coming. I believe he wants us to live <clears throat> with an absolute joyous expectation, moment by moment by moment by moment by moment. Now, it, when you look at Paul's writings, you can tell he really believes Christ could come tomorrow. Christ could come tomorrow. Christ could come tomorrow. And it's been 2,000 years, but I think if Paul were here 2,000 years later, you know what his attitude would be? Christ could come tomorrow. Christ could come tomorrow. He wouldn't change a thought, even though it's been 2,000 years since he last wrote a letter to the church. Christ could come tomorrow. We need to live with that kind of expectation in our hearts. So leaders like Paul and Silas and Timothy have glory and joy in the Lord. Because he tells him, I have glory and joy in the Lord for every soul that goes into heaven that God somehow allowed me to participate in seeing that message of the gospel get communicated and shared with them. Okay. I just, we, I don't know what it looks like. I promise you. Because scripture doesn't give me enough clarity. But somehow, some way, for every life that you touch, I think there's going to be 
an incredible, eternal joy because you were willing to be a part of God's plan to touch another soul. If you really want to, <clears throat> you know, we'd look about our bank accounts and our investments or whatever, and we want, you know, we want to see growth in some kind of investment fund or mutual fund or whatever. We, wanna, we see something that shows, you know, growth. But the greatest thing we could put our investment in is souls. Investing in the souls of humanity. And knowing that if I touch one, I'm going to have somebody I'm going to celebrate with in heaven because I've touched one life. If I touch two, multiply it. Touch three, touch 10, touch 100. How many years, how many opportunities might God bring before us to touch souls and then have an eternal embrace with that soul in heaven because they were so grateful that you were used by God to silence the lies and the deceptions of the enemy and hear the voice of God speaking so clearly that they accepted Christ and desired to walk with him all the days of their life. That can be for a un hard-hearted unbeliever. That can be for a backslidden person who has walked away from Christ. That can be somebody who's suffering from doubts and confusion or hurts and anger over some very specific situation they're facing in their life. Knowing that if we can get them built up in the faith, strong in their encouragement to walk with Christ, they have an eternal reward waiting for them. And we, I don't know why, I don't know how, we get to share in an extra level of joy somehow, some way in heaven. Shouldn't that drive us forward? Shouldn't that change the way we think, both about our own life and the life of those that God so blesses us to encounter wherever we go? What a blessing he is to us. We need to recognize, this is not a true study of Satan, but we need to recognize he's always there trying to steal, kill, and destroy, trying to go about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We need to be so distasteful to Satan and so unshakable in our faith with God that he really recognizes, I need to move on. Wouldn't that be awesome? Okay, our faith should be anchored and secured in Christ, in his word, alone, and that should give us an inexpressible joy. Father, we thank you for, once again, the Apostle Paul and his words here. Help us, Lord, to apply what Paul was trying to communicate to the church in Thessalonica into our own lives, Lord. To stand firm on the truth and authority of your word, as we looked at last week. To have joy inexpressible in our hearts every moment of every day, Lord God. For being included in your kingdom and being included in your plan to share and witness and to testify of your goodness and your truth to a world that needs to hear the message, Lord. Empower us, equip us, Lord. Give us your spirit to guide us and lead us in things that are too difficult for us to do in the flesh, but are more than possible by the power of your spirit working in us, Lord. So fill us up with your power, Lord God. Give us the spirit to guide us and lead us, Lord. And let us surrender to the name, the power, and authority of Jesus Christ because it's in that name that we pray. Amen. All right, we have prayer teams up front. Love to have you come up for prayer. Don't forget, baptisms next week. So if anybody has interest in that, we want to make it an incredible celebration. We want you to let us know, and we will, like I said, have a class at 930, and we will use this for the first time. See you next week.